So a third of heat transport, uh, continuing from last time, is radiation. So <clears throat> this might be an obvious question, but it's it, perhaps it's not so clear how the Earth is warmed. I mean, we know it comes from the sun, and we know that it's thermal energy because thermal energy is any sort of energy gained when the temperature increases, basically. But how does the thermal energy get here? Well, okay, you guys all know the answer to it. It's solar radiation. But most people don't actually know what radiation really is. And in fact, radiation is a means of uh, transmitting heat without contact. Right, the sun is not touching the earth. It's not even in, in convective contact with the earth. Like there isn't a gas that's connecting the earth to the sun. It's just vacuum, almost, almost perfect vacuum. The sun, almost perfect vacuum for 93 million miles, earth. So it's not quite clear that heat can be transferred across that gap. But it, it, indeed this does happen and it's via radiation. So radiation is nothing more than light waves. at least solar radiation. There are other kinds of radiation, of course, but the radiation that we're talking about, the radiation that is a means of trans transmitting heat, is just light waves. So we know the sun emits light, but when we're talking about radiation, we're not just talking about visible light. So where do these light waves actually come from then? They come from the vibrating electrons. So when we were talking about polarizations, we spoke a little bit about how uh, light interacts with matter, right? We said something along the lines of light is electromagnetic waves, electrons are charged, and so when, when electromagnetic waves pass by electrons, they vibrate. But that relationship goes both ways. Um, so we know, or rather it, it, it should be fairly straightforward, that if a light wave causes electrons to vibrate, electrons vibrating may very well cause light waves, and indeed that is true. But the next question then to ask is, what causes, what causes the vibrating electrons? So one source is the random motion due to thermal energy. Right, thermal energy is a macroscopic measure of the microscopic random kinetic and potential energies that the particles might have due to their random motion from bouncing around on each other. And so what we see from this fact is that hotter things, i.e. things that have more thermal energy and hence have more random vibration, emit more radiation. And again, you guys kind of have this intuition here. Um, think like a glowing rod of iron, right? If you, the hotter you get the glowing rod, the brighter it gets. That is radiation. Um, and so while, while this relationship is true, hotter things do emit more radiation, um, the mathematical relationship, which you know, is something that we care about as potential physicists, um, the mathematical relationship is not obvious. It's not something that we will be able to easily construct in the same way that we did with the conduction relationship. So, Regardless, we do know the formula, and I'll give it to you in a minute, but it turns out that it's absolute temperature, not relative temperature, that matters here. So up until now, everything that's mattered with regards to temperature, like convection, conduction, all of those just depended on temperature differences. Um, here, here we actually need the, an absolute measurement of the temperature. So I want you guys to think about why that might, have, might be the case. Um, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'll spoil it just yet, but if you come to office hours, uh, I, I might talk about it if you guys can't figure it out. But it is relevant that indeed it is the absolute temperature, i.e. the temperature measured in Kelvin that matters here. So the formula that we get, you have to do a lot of, uh, a lot of complicated, well, not that complicated, but a lot of physics to get this equation is the Stefan-Boltzmann law. This can be, this can be theoretically um, 
derived, but in general, I, I, I believe it was initially discovered empirically. So this says the rate at which uh, heat flows outwards. So I'm putting absolute values here because the, uh, we want to talk about the rate at which heat leaves an object, the, the, the thermal energy, sorry, the radiation is leaving the object and carrying away heat with it. So I'm putting it in absolute values just so we don't have to worry about a negative sign. This is equal to sigma, and I'll explain what all these are, times E times A times T to the fourth. All right, so first, this T, this is the absolute temperature in Kelvin, and it's to the fourth power. So it very much depends strongly on the temperature. This A here, this is the surface area of the emitting object. E, not the number E, not Euler's constant. This is, a, this is just another property of the emitting object. This is a number that describes how well an object emits light. Not all objects are equal in that regard. Some objects emit, like, emit light better than other objects. This E, called emissivity, basically tells us, it's basically a constant that just fudges it for different quantities. And then this sigma, this is just a universal constant known as the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Um, and it is equal to 5.67 times 10 to the minus eighth watts per Kelvin to the fourth meters squared. And so you can check that um, emissivity should be unitless. It's just, a, it's just a number between zero and one, actually. Zero being it doesn't emit light very well, or it doesn't emit radiation at all. One being it emits light, or emits, it emits radiation perfectly. And so you can figure out then that the, uh, the units check out, the Stefan Boltzmann constant has watts per Kelvin to the fourth meters squared. Surface area has units meters squared. Temperature of the fourth has units Kelvin to the fourth. And so we're left with watts, which is precisely the units of energy over time. So great. So this tells us how much, um, yes, yes, it, it's actually impossible to exceed one um, by definition. Well, OK, let me rephrase that. Um, this is an approximate law to begin with, meaning it only holds for large objects. Um, or for, for a large amount of molecules. Once you start talking about single and single and like just a single molecule, for example, this, this law doesn't make sense anyway, because temperature itself doesn't make sense for small quantities of substances, like single, multiple, or a few molecules. So um, there are no macroscopic objects that would have emissivities greater than one. Let me put it that way. I will explain that in a bit, um, but... Uh, I, well, actually, just think of it this way. If there were, if it was possible to have an emissivity greater than one, they would have just defined the Stefan Boltzmann constant, sigma, to be, let's say the maximum is two. They would have just defined the Stefan Boltzmann constant to be two times 5.67 times 10 to the negative eighth, and then just rescaled the emissivity to be one. It's just a way of scaling how good a thing is at, at emitting light between no emission and perfect emission. That's all. Um, right, so, so this is how much radiation is emitted, but we know that light waves have frequencies and wavelengths, right? So the question is, is what wavelengths are emitted? What frequencies are emitted? For example, um, we know that frequency slash wavelength is correlated with color, right? And so the hotter you get something, like a, like a brick of iron, as the iron gets hotter, it goes from a dull red to a yellow to a white. So that means that something must be changing in the frequency, right? Because the color's changing. Um, it turns out that all frequencies, all frequencies are emitted, um, but the amount of each frequency depends on T. So even though, in general, every frequency imaginable under the sun um, could be emitted, in principle, at normal everyday temperatures, a lot of the very, very, very high frequencies are emitted at very, very low amounts. Um, and indeed, at normal temperatures, I put normal like temperatures that we're used to as humans, most of the light is infrared. 
the most of the light is infrared. Um, infrared, by the way, means beyond red, I believe. Um, and it's literally just light that has a wavelength that's longer than the, than the longest wavelength we can see. Longest wavelength we can see is about 700 nanometers. Infrared light is light that has a range of about 700 nanometers to like 2,000 or like 5,000 nanometers or something. Uh, no, because it can even go up to, well, it goes all the way up to the microwave range. So um, infrared light is just light that's emitted that's at a lower frequency than what we can see, basically. And so that's what infrared cameras detect. They pick up the infrared radiation given off by things, because everything emits radiation because of uh, the stuff in Boltzmann law. It's just most of it's in the infrared and we can't see it. So, so, the question, so you might have the question, okay, so great. So does every object only emit radiation? i.e. it just emits, it doesn't do anything else. Like where, where does the radiate? Well, clearly no, the Earth absorbs radiation. And in fact, um, every object, every object that can emit can also absorb. And that's not, that should not be surprising, right? We know how the emission takes place. The emission is caused by electrons vibrating. And so if the electrons can vibrate to emit light at a certain frequency, then light, if light comes in with that frequency, it should be able to vibrate those electrons. So it, exactly how much a thing can emit is the same map that it can absorb. Um, and so that means that even if two things are not touching each other in any way, be it convection or conduction, the temperature uh, can be balanced between two objects by emitted and absorbed radiation. Meaning, um, assuming something is not in any sort of thermal contact with, like via conduction or convection, a thing will emit radiation just because of the stuff in Boltzmann law. That will take away thermal energy in the form of heat. But a thing will also absorb radiation, right, from just stuff around it. And the Earth absorbs radiation from the stars, absorbs radiation from the sun, from the moon, from Jupiter, and so on. Everything emits radiation, and some of that radiation gets to Earth and is absorbed. So the temperature of the Earth is balanced by the amount it emits versus the amount that it absorbs. And eventually, it will, it will get to a certain temperature where the amount emitted controlled by this law is balanced by the amount coming in, which is just however much it is. So two objects separated by a large distance can still come to equilibrium. And that's via radiation. So this is to say, yes, in fact, in fact, it does. Um, let me give it a quick definition just to carry on that point. So a perfect absorber slash emitter. So the the ability to absorb is exactly the same as the ability to emit. This is called a black body. So if a thing is a perfect absorber, sorry, if the thing is a perfect emitter, meaning that it has an emissivity of one, that means that is also a perfect absorber. It absorbs all light that hits it. And hence, it's called a black body. So a thing that's black, typically, the way that we understand it from a human level is that a thing that's black just absorbs the light that hits it, and none of it is reflected off. So, we, we, so there's no light that gets to our eyes from that object, right? Um, a green can absorbs all of, the energy, all of the light that hits it, except green waves. The green waves that hit it, the green light waves, they bounce off and they get to my eye, so it looks green. Something that's black just absorbs all of the light. And so we call it a black body if it is a perfect, if it is a perfect absorber or, and or emitter, um, because it would absorb all of the light that hits it. And if it's a perfect absorber, it's also a perfect emitter. So the point that I was gonna, going to make is, let's say you have two things that are very far away from each other, like the sun and the earth. If, the sun, if, if we consider that as a closed system, it's not, but it's a good enough approximation. The sun is emitting radiation that's hitting the earth, 
And then the Earth is emitting radiation that's just going out. Some of it hits the sun, some of it doesn't. So <clears throat> eventually, there will be a balance in the, in the energy coming in from the sun, which is calculated by the Stefan-Boltzmann law, plus a little bit more geometry, and the light emit and the radiation emitted by the Earth. And once there is that balance, once the energy in equals energy out, the temperature will come to equilibrium. Um, in general, two things that are, um, how do I want to phrase this? In, if there were no other sources of energy, in the sun there's thermonuclear energy that causes from the, the, the fusion processes that occur in the, in the core of the sun. If there were no other objects, if there were no other source of energy, if you just had a sun that was just gradually cooling off, and the earth, eventually the earth and the sun would match temperatures. Um, it would take a long time, obviously, because they're very big, but they would eventually match temperatures because the sun would be giving off energy in the form of heat due to radiation, um, and its temperature would drop. The earth would be absorbing that energy, increasing its temperature, until it emitted exactly as much energy as it absorbed. But as the sun cooled off and emitted energy, um, the amount of energy that it absorbs would go down. And so the temperatures of the two objects get closer and closer. And in fact, um, <clears throat> eventually what would happen is that the two objects would just decrease asymptotically to absolute zero because not all of the energy that comes from one goes to the other. It's just emitted in all directions, right? Right, so that's, that's the third means of uh, heat transfer. And as far as, as, far as, I, as, far as I wanna say, that's, that's all of them, right? There may be some more exotic ones, but we don't really uh, need to talk about those because for, for the most part, these are the ones that mostly contribute. So now we need to change gears a little bit. We need to talk about thermodynamic state. So now we're really getting into the meat of thermodynamics. So to give you a key definition, a thermodynamic state is the macroscopic condition of a system, um, of a system describable with just a few measurable quantities. So this is a key definition. This is what a thermodynamic state is. So when you say that something is in a thermodynamic state, you're saying that it has, it is, the, it is in the condition that can be precisely described by just a few numbers, basically. So great. That's not super helpful though, because we don't know what those quantities are. Um, so the quantities that I mentioned above, are called state variables. So they are the variables that describe the state. Not so surprising. This is, um, this is how we describe the conditions of the system. So a good example of this might be uh, a box containing gas. So that would be a very nice, simple um, thermodynamic system. So we could describe it um with the following thing things uh say pressure volume maybe number of moles of the gas there are other quantities too that i left out but the point is is you don't have to know where every atom is in order to describe the properties of that gas right it's enough to just say look it has this much pressure this much volume this much this many molecules and so on. Um, so examples of such, thermo of such state variables, and these are gonna be ones that we use frequently. Uh, as I already mentioned, pressure and volume. Also temperature is a state variable. Internal energy is a state variable. Internal energy is a superset of thermal energy, by the way. Um, number of particles, maybe number of moles rather. Um, point is, is the, there's a set of quantities that we can just measure, like in the real world that we can just go out and measure. 
or that we can easily calculate given a measurement, right? So we can't just go out and measure internal energy because measuring energy directly is difficult. But as we will see later, it's easily calculable from a measurement that we can make. Um, but not everything in thermodynamics, not every symbol that we use as a state variable. Uh, there are two examples that we're going to uh, that are going to pop up a lot: um, work and heat. So W and Q. Um, so these are not state variables because they are not properties of a system, right? These depend on pr the process that a system undergoes. So it, if you just have a system sitting there doing nothing, it doesn't have a work, it doesn't have a heat. Instead, work and heat are quantities that describe what's happening to a system, i.e. how much heat is flowing into a system, how much work is the system doing, and so on. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that um, thermodynamics basically is the study of how these quantities, work and heat, relate to the state variables, right? How does the heat and the work, how does that contribute to the thermal energy, and how does that change the pressure or the volume or the temperature and so on? Um, those are all, uh, that's basically all thermodynamics is. It's just, it's just figuring out the relationship between these process variables or non-state variables and the state variables. Because if you can completely describe a system using state variables, you just want to figure out how those state variables might change given something external, like heat, like work. Um, so there is another concept that I have to introduce. This is the equation of state. So it's an equation, as the name implies. Um, this is <coughs> it's an equation that relates the state variables to each other. Uh, but importantly, it relates the state variables to each other, i.e. it gives a relationship between state variables even when the state itself changes. So one way to think about this um, is an equation of state is like a function, right? Like if you, if you have y equals x squared, y will always equal x squared even if x changes from 1 to 2, right? y is still equal to x squared. The equation of state is like that. If you have some relationship between these state variables, even if you, even if say, like maybe you have a relationship between the temperature and the volume, if you, even if you change the temperature, the volume will change in such a way such that the relationship is still true. It's basically saying, look, or the equation of state is basically, there is a functional relationship, like a fundamental relationship between these quantities such that if you change one, the other one will change in a corresponding way. So, the equation of state, we, like the equation of state, is known for a lot of different systems. Um, we're going to talk about the simplest, which is the ideal gas. And you guys have probably actually seen what we're going to talk about today, uh, at least in some detail, in the form of PIVNERT, um, as my wife uh, always calls it. Um, you guys have probably seen that in high school or maybe in chemistry or something. So let's uh, let's talk about an ideal gas. So let's consider the simple system. of a gas in a box. So it's just a box closed on all sides. There's gas in it. Um, so we can measure a lot of the state variables. We can't measure all of them directly, as I mentioned, but we can measure a lot of them. So for example, we can make measurements about the pressure or the volume. The volume is just the size of the box, right? We can measure the pressure by attaching pressure sensors to the, to the sides of the box. Uh, we can measure temperature by sticking a thermometer in and so on and so forth. We can measure the number of moles. It turns out that we can experimentally determine an equation of state. An equation of state for this system. And the way we do that is we literally just say, look, OK, we have a box and a gas. What happens to the volume and to the pressure if we heat it up, if, if we change its temperature? 
what happens to the temperature and the volume um, if we change its pressure and so on. Like we can just find a relationship by doing experiments and looking for patterns. It turns out that the equation of state that we find is the following, it's PV equals NRT, or written a different way, PV equals capital N KB T. So I'm gonna put a box around this because this is, these are, these are the same thing, they are the ideal gas, they are, it is the ideal gas law. So R, it's just a number, it's 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, KB is a same Boltzmann, different number. It's the Boltzmann constant. Boltzmann constant. Uh, Stefan or uh, Boltzmann did quite a lot um, with regards to thermodynamics in the 1800s. That's why a lot of stuff is named after him. And it is just a number. It's 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Um, this N here, this is the number of molecules. The N over here, this is the number of moles. So they're the same thing. It's just a rewriting. Um, the relationship between these two is just given by the following relationship. R is equal to Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann constant. Uh, and it, for those of you who do not remember from high school, Avogadro's number Avogardo's number, I always mispronounce that. It's just, it's just a number with no units, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So the point is, is you could either describe the number of things that you have in terms of the total number of molecules, in which case you multiply it by Boltzmann's constant, or you describe it in terms of the number of moles, which is significantly smaller, and then you, the, the, the uh, proportionality constant becomes R. But Clearly, you can substitute in, um, like, for example, n is equal to na times little n, right? That's, that's what it means to have n moles of a substance. So there is a relationship here. That should be fairly straightforward. Um, right. So uh, this is just an experimentally determined fact. I mean, it's, it's an approximation, of course. Um, but it's like, why is this? Sorry, I don't know why my uh, Dropbox is trying to sync, which is probably slowing down my internet for you guys. I know that I'm, am, am I lagging on your end? Barely? Oh, okay, well then I'll just continue. It looks like I'm lagging on my end, but if it's fine, then it's fine. Um, just a quick note here, another, another note, I guess. Um, we have to use absolute temperature here again. That's not a very good B. Absolute temperature, which is in Kelvin, as we've seen here, because there is no delta T, just regular T. Just like in the Stefan Boltzmann law, where we had a relationship that just depended on the temperature, not on a, the difference of temperature of two things. Here again, the, this uh, ideal gas law just depends on the temperature, not the difference in temperature of two different things. So we need to just use a single that like this only makes sense in a single system of units. So we have to use absolute temperature here. We could have done we could have defined it in terms of Celsius then we would have had to basically add 273.15 to the temperature and it would have been a messier equation. So by the way, this equation is another good reason why the Kelvin is defined. It basically, well, this is actually the same reason, the relationship between pressure and temperature um, is encapsulated by this equation, right? For a fixed volume of gas, we can relate pressure to an R over V, that's the slope times T. And so this is the equation that we had before, or this is the line on the graph that we had. And so if we use the appropriate units, when the temperature is zero, the pressure is zero. Right, so I mentioned that we're talking about an ideal gas, but then I just said a gas in a box. So you guys would be rightfully curious if I didn't explain what an ideal or what ideal means when I talk about an ideal gas. So in this case, ideal means that the gas molecules don't interact in any appreciable manner. 
Um, and for the most part, this is a good approximation. It's, I mean, in real, in real life, in reality, gases do interact with each other, but very, very, very small amounts. Like it's very rare that it happens because gas molecules are in general very far away from one another. And when they do interact, they don't interact a whole lot. Like the magnitude of the interaction is not very, not very big. So this is a good approximation for most gases at most temperatures that we experience. Um, so that's one example of an equation of state. In general, equations of state relate one variable to another. Right, one state variable, sorry, to all of the others, or to a set of others, i.e., in this example, we have P as a function of N, V, and T is equal to KB times NT over V. So this says, look, this, th what the equation of state really does is it says you only need to know a few of the state variables. You only need to know the number of molecules, the temperature, and the volume, and then the pressure is just determined. And so you guys, so um, in, your, in your mathematics like education, you, you've learned that typically in order to solve for a variable, you need like for every variable you want to solve for, you need a piece of information, right? So I gave you a whole bunch of state variables. For example, in, in this case, P, B, uh, P, B, N, and T. Those are four state variables that well describe a gas. So the question is, is where did this equation come from? This is basically you've solved for one variable in terms of the other, in terms of the others. So where, what does it mean that you did have four variables, but now you can solve, you can solve for one of them in terms of the other? That means that you have some sort of extra information. Typically, that comes in the form of an equation that you can use to solve for one of your variables. But in this case, we derived an equation to solve for one of our var variables. That it, that's what the ideal gas law is. That's the equation of state. Where does that information come from? It turns out in this case, it comes from the assumption that we're making. We are assuming that the uh, thing that we're describing that has these state variables is an ideal gas. And so the constraint that we put on our system, that it has the properties of an ideal gas, that allows us to solve for one of our variables in terms of the others. And we'll see that in fact, we can, uh, the ideal gas assumption actually adds other constraints too and will allow, allow us to solve for other, ideal, for other state variables as well. Um, put another way, uh, this, this equation can also be written as V as a function of pressure, uh, number of moles and T, which would then be R and T over uh, P. That's just another rewriting of the ideal gas law. Um, earlier, I mentioned that, we're, that uh, internal energy, which we usually abbreviate with the letter U, is a state variable. But we can't measure it, so we have to be able to calculate it. So how do we do that? Well, i.e., we should have some sort of state equation that relates the internal energy to the other state variables, and we'll get there. We're just not there yet. Uh, we'll get there soon. Before we can get there, though, we need to talk about the kinetic theory of gases. Right. OK, so often what we do in thermodynamics, and in fact, this is, this is a kind of a related subfield called statistical mechanics, is we think about what happens microscopically. So in our example, we have a whole bunch of gas molecules flying around and bouncing into walls and bouncing into each other. And we use what we know or what we, what we can do, we, we, what, we, we use what we can derive um, from those assumptions that we make, like the assumption that it's just a bunch of particles bouncing around and, st and so on. We derive, a we derive conclusions from those assumptions about the macroscopic way that that collection of objects behaves. So that's, that's statistical mechanics in a nutshell. You learn something about the individual particles, and then you say, OK, now there's a lot of them. What can we say on average about the collection of them? So what we're about to do is a good example of this sort of process where we um, talk about just a sit. We, we talk about what happens for a single particle. And then we, uh, from there, we draw conclusions about what happens to the average. So. Let's start with an ideal gas. 
So I'm going to draw a box. Maybe it's a see-through box. It has a whole bunch of different gas molecules buzzing around doing their own thing. So there's a, there's a set of assumptions that go in to this uh, calculation that we're about to do. And so, like I said, we're going to make some assumptions about the microscopic properties. And then we are going to use those assumptions, which hopefully are reasonable, to draw conclusions about the macroscopic properties. So one assumption is that the particles have random, random positions and velocities. Right, they're not all. For, for example, they're not all clustered in the bottom left corner. They're randomly distributed throughout the box. They're not all moving to the left. Their velocities are randomly distributed. Another assumption is that it's an ideal gas, meaning that they don't interact with each other. They don't bounce off each other. They just do their own thing. So we can treat each molecule independently. Um, we're going to make a third assumption that there is no energy lost to the walls. meaning that if a molecule bounces off of a wall, it doesn't lose some of its energy to the wall. And similarly, we're going to assume the walls are smooth, basically so that there's no friction with the wall. Like if a particle is moving around along the wall, it won't lose energy that way either. And then we're also going to assume that the gas is monoatomic. This last assumption is actually, uh, will turn out to have not been necessary, but it simplifies our calculations to start with. And then we'll talk about what happens when we loosen that restriction later. So with those assumptions in mind, let's consider a single particle bouncing off a wall. Right, so a particle is just flying through the box. Eventually, it'll hit a wall. So here's the picture zoomed in a lot. So uh, let's get some coordinates. Let's call this direction the x direction, this direction the y direction. So we have a particle that comes in hits the wall with some velocity. Um, and so we can decompose that velocity into two components, say vi in the y direction, and say vx, sorry, vi in the x direction. In, I stands for initial. After it hits the wall, well, what we know about the fact that no energy is lost to the wall, this would be an elastic reflection or an elastic collision. And so the ball, or not the ball, sorry, I'm used to uh, 9a, the particle will bounce off. And in fact, this, the law of reflection will apply here because it's an elastic collision. So it bounces off at the same angle it came in with. And so in particular, it will come off with two components, say, call it VFX and VF, sorry, VFY. It'll just bounce off the wall like that, right? So the fact that it's an elastic collision, like I said, lets us conclude that vfx is equal to negative vix, meaning the x velocity that it had coming in is the same as the x velocity, but in the opposite direction coming out. And that vfy is equal to viy, meaning its vertical speed is unaffected by this collision. So what, we, so what we can say about momentum, and you should be really digging into your 9a, uh, your 9A chops now, because uh, we're going to be using some of that 9A material now. Uh, the, the momentum, the change in momentum in the x direction, well, it's m, m being the mass of the molecule or the particle, times vfx minus m times vix. This is just 2 times m vix, right? Just because they're this, uh, one is the opposite of the other. Um, and then the change in momentum in the y direction, it's just m times vfx minus vfy, sorry, minus m times viy, which is just 0 in this case. So the impulse on the particle, remember impulse is um, force applied over time, and there's a relationship between change momentum and impulse. By the wall, it's given by the following relationship. So remember, J is the letter that we typically use for impulse. So, it's, so here we have J is equal to F delta T. That's the force applied um, that causes the change of momentum. And this is equal to delta PX. So really, this is the impulse in the X direction, because the impulse in the Y direction is 0. 
Um, and so this is 2m vix. So we can solve for the force on the wall by the particle. So by the way, I did a subtle, I made a subtle point here. The, we calculated the impulse on the particle by the wall. But, and, and so there is some force associated with that, right, and some duration. But Newton's first, no, third law, sorry, <laughs> Newton's third law is the equal and opposite reaction business. And so if the, if the wall applies a force on the particle, the particle also applies a force on the wall. And it's the same force, just in the opposite direction, of course. So the force on the wall by the particle is 2m v i uh, 2m v i in the x direction divided by delta t, right? It's the same magnitude as the force on the wall uh, on the particle by the wall. Um, and by the way, I'm only cons I'm just considering absolute values here. Um, so that's great. That tells us how how hard or what force the particle applies to the wall. Now remember that we're going to be thinking about things on average. That's our goal. So even though the collision itself occurs very, very quickly, like the particle touches the wall and the collision's over, on average, we can ask questions about how frequently the particle hits this wall. And then we can smear out that force over that entire region. Because if we were to think about it, the force really, the force equation looks like this. If we were to plot force with time on that wall, it bounces off the wall, it bounces off some other walls, and then it comes back periodically, right? But because we're because at the end of the day we're going to talk about trillions of particles, imagine stacking all of these up next to each other. We can instead just talk about a small force from a single particle applied constantly, which is what we're going to do. So what we want to what we want to know is uh, how long or how often does this particle hit the wall? And we want to know how often it hits this wall, by the way, uh, because we're, we're not, we don't want to overcount. So the round trip distance, assuming the box has length L, let me go add that to my drawing. Length L, there we go. Um, the round trip distance is 2L. So it bounces off this wall, and then it'll bounce off another wall. It, it has some distance that it has to cover. It has to cover 2L units in the x direction, and the speed or the velocity in the x direction is vix. And so the time between hits, this delta t is 2L divided by vix. So if we wanted to smear out this force over the entire, uh, over the entire uh, round trip so that it's always, so we can just treat it as a constant force rather than spikes, we would get that f is equal to 2m vix divided by 2L over vix, which we can rewrite as mvix squared divided by L. OK, great. So that tells us the force that a single particle applies to the wall on average. Now, suppose this was just the i particle. The i particle out of n. So there are n particles. This is just the ith one. Um, then the force from the ith particle, the force from the ith particle would be mi, it's the mass of the ith particle, times vix squared over L. And so the total force from all of the particles on average, so now we don't have to think about it spreading out. Now we can just think of them as each doing their own impulse, but those impulses add, add up together. The total force on the wall would be the sum of all of the individual forces from all the individual molecules. So we could write that as just the sum over Fi, which is 1 over L times the sum, sum from, let's say, I equals 1 to N. Equals 1 to N. Um, Mi Vi x squared. So the, um, great, that tells us what the force is on the wall at and it would be constant, of course, um, because it's not changing and there's no time dependence here. 
So the pressure, how do we relate force and pressure? Well, the pressure of the gas is equal to the force on the wall by gas, by the gas, divided by the area of the wall. Right, that, that's, pressure is just force divided by area. And so pressure, P, is equal to force divided by L squared. That's the area of the wall. It's a square because it's the side of a cube. And so we know what the total force is. This is one. So we have 1 over L cubed, cubed times the sum, sum from I equals 1 to N, MIVIX squared. And there was nothing special about the x direction. The same exact pressure would be on the in the y direction, in the z direction. If you, we had just considered a wall that was in the x z plane, or in the y z plane, or in the x y plane, and so on. So it turns out that this is e also equal to. Uh, oh, let me simplify. L cubed, by the way, is one over v. Sorry, L cubed is v. So this is just one over v times i equals one to n m i v i x squared. But that should be also equal to 1 over v times i equals 1 to n times miviy squared, and the same for the z direction. miviz squared. Whole point is that there's nothing special about x, right? So all of these contribute. Now, we have a whole bunch of expressions now. We have p is equal to this one, and p is equal to this one, and p is equal to that one. So we have three equations. We can do algebra to them. So we can add these up. We get that 3p, because each one is 1p, is equal to 1 half, sorry, 1 over v times the sum from i equals 1 to n of just mi. And now, because we're adding up the squares, we can factor out mi, and then we add up all of those terms. So it's vix squared plus viy squared plus viz squared. That is just vi squared. That's just the full velocity of a particle squared, right? Great. We have a nice relationship there. So far, it's nice, but it's not super useful yet. But with one more trick, multiplying and dividing by 2, so multiply by 2, now divide by 2, we get 1 half mivi squared. And now this should look awfully familiar. This is equal to 2 over v times the sum of all of the kinetic energies of the particles. And we're almost done. An ideal gas has no potential energy. Potential energies come from interactions between particles. An ideal gas, by definition, we assume there are no interactions. There's no forces between the particles. So there's no potential energy. So that means that the total internal energy, and remember from 9a, total internal energy is the sum of kinetic and potential energy. This is just equal to kinetic energy. So what's the takeaway? Put an exclamation mark there. So what we have is we have 3p equals 2 over v times u. So this was the, uh, sorry, the kinetic energy of a single particle was just the total energy of that single particle. So the total energy of the whole system is the sum of the kinetic energies of all the system, of, of every particle in the system, u. So, so that's how we get this equation. And so that implies that we have PV equals 2 thirds u. So we're almost there. Um, we have a, I mean, this is a nice relationship. It's useful to begin with. But we can do a little bit more. We can use the ideal gas law. We assumed our particles or our gas was an ideal gas. So we can use the ideal gas law to relate them. We get that PV equals nRT. And so that implies, we substitute in what PV is, that implies that U is equal to 3 halves nRT. And so uh, again, um, only Kelvin is allowed here. So you can't use Celsius, you have to use Kelvin. So what do we learn from this equation? We learn 
that u is proportional to temperature, i.e., if you double the temperature, you double the internal energy. And by the way, it should be clear now that this it, that it should that it very much depends on what units you use, and that's why we have to stick with just Kelvin. If we were using Celsius, say we were talking about zero degrees Celsius, doubling that is zero, which doesn't change the temperature, but that would imply that you have to double the internal energy because if you double one, you double the other. But uh, so so you have to use the appropriate unit system, um, and the appropriate unit system here is Kelvin, of course. Um, so this is a useful relationship. So the ideal gas law gave us one relationship. It gave us the, I, sorry, the ideal gas assumption gave us one relationship. It told us that the ideal gas law holds. Other assumptions that we had to make here though are not just the ideal gas law. For example, we had to assume that particles had random positions and velocities, that the walls were smooth and so on, and that the gas was monoatomic. Those extra assumptions, those extra pieces of information allowed us to derive another relationship that tells us about another state variable, that is the internal energy, the total internal energy of the system. So that's why we were able to get that relationship because we had more information. Um, by the way, uh, and I'll get to this later, it's perhaps it's not clear to you where I actually use the monoatomic assumption here. And we'll talk about that later today um, in, in, a, in a page or two. But first, let's, uh, before we continue, let's talk about another quantity that we can get at this is the root mean square particle speed in a gas. So now we have two equations that relate the state variables. So we can even just start talking, we can just start doing stuff with them, start calculating. And one example of a thing that we can calculate is the root mean square particle speed. So the above equation tells us that u is equal to 3 halves n times kb times t. I just replaced n times r, little n times r times cap, or with capital N times kb. Those two things are the same. They are the same number. Not just different units, they're the same. And so we define the quantity lowercase u. So we define it to just be capital U divided by n. So if the total internal energy of the system is five joules, we divide that five joules amongst every particle. This is just the average energy per particle. Right, that's not surprising. You have a total amount of energy. You, div you have a total amount of stuff. If you divide it equally amongst all of the, th all of the stuff, then you'd get an average of that quantity per thing, right? Nothing surprising there. And so that gives us that the average energy per particle, little u, is 3 halves times kb times t. Great, OK, that tells us how much energy the particle has. Cool. Now, recall that. The energy per particle, the actual energy per particle, is just 1 half times the mass of the particle times the, the velocity squared of the particle, right? So we can calculate an average energy, sorry, an average velocity of the particles in a gas. And I'm putting average in quotes here. Um, because the standard average that you might want to take, where you just add up all of the velocities and divide by the number of particles, that doesn't really help because velocity has direction. So a particle is just as because a particle is just as likely to be going say left as opposed to right, adding up the all of the velocities is just probably is on average is just going to give you zero. So we don't want to just add up the velocities because that won't actually tell us like how quickly a thing is moving on average, right? That'll just tell us that they're traveling in every direction equally. So instead, we compute a different type of quantity. It's a different type of uh, average called a RMS, or root mean square. And so what a, all a root mean square is, is it's a way of averaging vectors. And the reason you want to do this is because the, uh, the, it basically neglects, it, it basically gives you an average of the magnitudes of the vectors. So a root mean square is exactly as it sounds. Just do the things that it says in order. First, you square. In, sorry, in reverse order. So we want to find the RMS velocity. So V RMS, again, it's just like an average of the magnitudes. Let's first square the thing. So we actually, uh, maybe we do it in the order that it says. So first we take a square root. Then we take the average, which is denoted by these square brackets. 
So root check mean is an average, and then we square it, and then we square the thing. So this is how the root mean square is defined. You square the thing, take its average, take the square root. And then maybe you can see why this just gives us an average of the magnitudes, because if everything had the same magnitude, this would just be equal to the magnitude that everything had, because you're squaring it and then taking the square root. But it prevents two things from, it prevents the problem where if two objects are traveling at the same speed but in opposite directions, it prevents them from canceling out. Instead, they'll just average to be the same value. And that's because we're squaring it, which gets rid of the, like, the negative sign effectively. But we can rewrite this as square root of 2 over m times the square root of 1 half m times the average of v squared. Right? All I did was multiply and, and divide by square root of 2 over m. And assuming every particle has the same mass, which you know it's an assumption that every particle is the same mass, but assuming it's a pure gas, this gives us that the, actually, um, we don't even need to assume that. Well, yeah, we, we actually don't need to assume that. Um, so regardless, we can absorb the 1 half m v squared in there. Um, and so that just becomes the average kinetic energy. But we already have a formula for the average energy. The average energy is this lowercase u, because they're monoatomic, so the, the average energy is the same as the average kinetic energy. And so this is equal to square root 2 over m times square root 3 halves kb times t. Right? And so doing some more math, we get that v rms, and it's just simplification, is square root of 3 kb t divided by m. So if you have two gases at the same temperature, the gas that's made up of heavier molecules will have slower average velocity. Um, in fact, this statement, this is true for all ideal gases. Um, monoatomic or otherwise. And by the way, if you guys don't know what monoatomic means, it just means like the molecule, there, there are no um, molecules, it's just single gas atoms. Like argon doesn't form molecules, it just floats around, same with helium. But, so monoatomic as opposed to diatomic, like oxygen, like O2, oxygen, uh, like oxygen molecules. Now, previously we made the assumption that we're only dealing with monoatomic gases, but um, and so you might think that this result only applies to monoatomic gases. It turns out it actually applies to, in general to all ideal gases, and you just go through the same process, but for the ideal gases instead. Um, it changes up a little, like the, the calculation gets a little bit messier, but you end up with the same result. So I'm not going to do that. Um, what we learn from this formula is just that heavier particles in a mixture move slower. That's all. Okay. So I did say I would get to the. Oh, right. So we're going to move on to another topic very closely related called equal partition of energy. Um, so I met, I've mentioned this now twice that we made the mono, we made an assumption about monoatomicity that the gas is monoatomic. But where did we use that assumption? It's not quite clear. Uh, if you don't think about this extra hard anyway. Like, why did we need to make that assumption to begin with? So, uh, not really, actually. Well, okay, a little bit, but not even there, because you can have ideal gases that are formed by diatomic molecules. Then the then the diatomic constraint that or the the sorry the ideal gas assumption is not that the atoms don't interact with each other, but it's the but it's that the molecules don't interact with other molecules. Ideal gases are just an ideal gas is just a collection of particles that don't interact with each other. So if those particles are complex molecules, that's okay. But there can, but the point is, is we just want to imagine that they don't have interactions with other discrete groupings. So let's think about what would happen if we used a diatomic molecule. So the example, so the calculation we did, we had the molecule strike the wall, 
So in this case, a diatomic molecule looks you know, something like a dumbbell or something, coming in with a velocity, bounces off, but now it's not quite clear what happens. Now the molecule could be moving, but it could also now be rotating too. It could be rotating and moving. And so the fact that we made a monoatomic assumption, the assumption that the particles were monoatomic, meant that we didn't have to account for possible rotation, for example, of the molecule after it hits the wall, i.e. Um, we assumed that all the energy that it had stayed as translational kinetic energy. Remember from 9a, there's translational and rotational kinetic energy. In this case, though, now the energy that it may have had beforehand, let's say it wasn't rotating before, that energy is not all uh, translational kinetic energy. Now there's another term. Uh, let's make this wall slightly smaller. Um, one half i omega after squared, right? So now some of that energy can end up in rotational. But we can handle this issue, actually. Like, like this, is, this is a non-issue. We handle it by making some assumptions about probabilities and statistics. So there is a theorem called the equipartition theorem. which is a statement that is as such. Uh, when a certain amount of energy is given to a system like this, say, uh, such as like a randomly, such as randomly moving particles. That, that's, that's the system that I'm talking about. Oop. Oh, just unplug my tablet and it will die if I let it, if it unplugged for too long. Uh, when a certain amount of energy is given to a system like this, all of the modes, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, that energy can be in, can be contained in, get an equal share. Okay, so what's a mode? Oh, I don't need a quote there. So a mode is just <clears throat> it's just a quantity, or it's a container. It's kind of it's kind of an abstract idea. It's a quantity that can have energy added to it. without affecting the other quantities. And I know that this sounds really vague and abstract. So let me give an example for you to think about. So the total energy of a system, sorry, the total kinet translational kinetic energy of the system is 1 half mvx squared plus 1 half mvy squared plus 1 half mvz squared. Each of these are a mode. So there are three uh, kinetic energy translational modes. So the point is, when we were just talking about monoatomic gases, the only, the only modes to which energy could be added were translational kinetic energy modes. Those are the only places where you can put energy without affecting the other energies. And there are three of them, because you could put energy here. You could give it a kick in the x direction without affecting the y or the z direction. You could give it a kick in the y direction without affecting the x or the z direction, and so on. And so we actually used the fact that the, uh, that the pressure, which is related to the energy, is the same in all of the directions. We actually already used that fact that the, all of the particles will have the same, will on average have the same amount of kinetic energy in, in each direction. So modes are often referred to as degrees of freedom. So the point is, is a monoatomic gas would just have three modes. So if you added a certain amount of energy, 
to your to a single molecule to a single uh, atom in your monoatomic gas, that energy would on average be distributed equally to each of those three modes. So the x direction kinetic energy, the y direction kinetic energy, and the z direction kinetic energy. So you might see what to do about rotation. You can also add rotational energy. to diatomic or larger molecules. Without changing the kinetic energy. So rotational mode, rotational modes, or so rotational energies are more, mo are more modes. So in the case that I've given here, this diatomic molecule, it would have the three translational kinetic energy modes because it's still, it still can move in the x, the y, and the z direction. And you could add energy in any of those directions. But it can also now rotate in two distinct ways. It could rotate about, say, the, um, imagine my pen is the diatomic molecule. It could rotate this way without affecting its rotation in any of the other directions or its translational motion. Or it could rotate this way. And so there are two more modes. One would be, one half i omega x squared, and the other one would be one half i omega y squared, and maybe the z axis is the axis along that it can't rotate in. No, no. Um, there is energy that can be associated with bonds, and we will get to that, but not yet. No, the rotational energy is 100% an. Uh, a statement about the system itself, not about the individual parts of the system. Um, so we know that on average, monoatomic gases, and we know this because we did this calculation just a minute ago, get three halves KBT energy per molecule or energy per particle. That was the calculation we did earlier. Um, that's the average energy per particle. Or equivalently, one half kBT energy per mode per particle. So if you have a single particle, each part, or at least this is a, at least for monoatomic gases, it seems to be the case that each mode of the monoatomic gas would get exactly one half kBT worth of energy. That comes from the equal partition theorem and the calculation we did earlier. And it turns out that this is generally true about all modes. If you, uh, you could go and you could redo this calculation, the entire calculation that we did that involved uh, the particle bouncing off the wall and the energy that it gets and so on, you could redo that entire calculation and you would find that on average, diatomic gases, at least at low temperatures if you don't consider vibrations, get five halves kBT units of energy per particle. And they have three translational kinetic energy modes and two uh, rotational kinetic energy modes. So it seems that the pattern holds, and indeed it does, we can prove this, but we're not going to, that every mode in an ideal gas on average, actually every mode in general, uh, gets one half kBT units of energy. So the total energy can be computed as such. The total energy U in a, in a collection of gases is equal to N, times, which is the number of particles, times the number of modes per particle times 1 half kBT. And this is a remarkably useful formula because all it tell, all, all it requires is the temperature of the gas and the number of particles. And then you have to know something about the structure of those particles. Are they monoatomic? If so, that number is three. Are they diatomic? If so, that number is either five or seven, depending on its temperature. Is it more complicated? Is, is it um, like a triangle? Then it would be six, uh, and so on. So the point is, is we've used, um, <clears throat> we have another way of representing the, um, the total energy in terms 
of the temperature. And so you can actually relate those two formulas. U is equal to that formula. U is also equal to 3 halves n times, well, actually, that's, this formula is only true from the, uh, for a monoatomic gas. So if we want the equivalent formula for diatomic, that just for, uh, let me write, for example, for a diatomic gas at low temperatures, and I'll, I will explain this later on Friday, um, the energy would be n times 5 times 1 half kBT, which is, you know, 5 halves n kBT. So at a given temperature, a diatomic gas is going to have more energy than a monoatomic gas. And the way to see that is that the temperature, all the temperature does is it tells you basically how fast those molecules are moving. So at a fixed temperature, a monoatomic gas and a diatomic gas, they're going to have the same speed, the same amount of translational kinetic energy. But because of the equal partition theorem, the diatomic gas has to have even more energy because however much energy it has in its translational modes, it has to have the same amount of energy in its rotation. So <clears throat> in its rotational mode, so it just has more energy overall because it stores some of it in the form of rotation. All right, I think that's probably a good stopping point. That's where I expect it to get to anyway. So let's stop there and open it up for questions. So uh, yeah, let's, let's stop there. So does anybody have questions? I know we went through a lot. Um, but this is where, this is like real, like, go away. This is like real physics here that we're doing. Like we're analyzing like gases on a microscopic, on a microscopic level and using that to derive empirically determined results, which is kind of neat. Um, no, we're not gonna cover van der Waals at all. I don't think. Oh, we'll cover it just a little bit, but like not in any sort of uh... Yeah, no, actually, I don't think that we're going to, um, we're not going to really cover how it works. I mean, we'll talk about it in just a little bit of detail, but we're not going to really talk about it in any, actually, I don't even know if I have it in my notes. I could add a little bit about the Van der Waals force, but um, so so the the stuff that you need for today's for the lab that was due today should have been covered today. That's my understanding. Um, lab seven. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that you need anything about Van der Waals for, yes, yes, you can still apply the ideal gas law. Oh. Maybe there was an expectation that, yeah, you could still apply the ideal gas law. You would just apply it separately for the diatomic and monoatomic. Uh, so the ideal gas law is still true, like the PV equals NRT. Um, but because they have different properties, you would probably want to just like, in an, ideal in, an, in an ideal gas, they don't mix with each other or they don't interact. So it doesn't matter if they're mixed or not. You would just add the pressure from them individually to, uh, to get the sum pressure. Uh, turning it in late or not doing it at all, or like like if you turn it in late, or oh in so a low or no pass. So I think it's like three or more low lower. So a lower no pass for a single lab is if it's late or if it's um, done really poorly. Like if you clearly didn't put in any any effort, for example. Oh, okay. So I'm actually just going to briefly, uh, 
he covered the he covered the van der Waals equation, but I didn't. So um, let me just briefly touch on the van der Waals equation. Uh, good thing it's still recording. The van der Waals equation is just a uh, the van der Waals equation is just a better model, basically. Um, it's it all it is 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 just a better model. Actually, you know what? Uh, I'll tell you to read about it in the textbook. It's uh, it's uh, 5.5. .5. It's all it is though is it's just another equation of state. So it's a better approximation than the ideal gas law that treats particles as if they're actually solid things that don't pass through each other. That's all. Um, but yeah, it's it's described. There's like a little paragraph on it um, uh, in like the middle of section 5.5. Um, Seth, check the lab syllabus just to be sure. I'm going to stop recording, by the way. <laughs>